Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your great attendance at this meeting today. I think you will really be happy that you came when you learn all that Sister Sharon has to tell you. Thank you very much for coming. I wanted to mention that historians during the time of St. Albert the Great, when he was living, um, he, they, he had, that they said to him that he was, that both in his knowledge and in the way that he taught, he excelled every other teacher and professor. And they pointed out that he had a remarkable investigative curiosity about him and that he always used the scientific approach to come to his knowledge. And so all of you scientists will be happy to hear that. Since then, many others have said that, um, that there, there's not one field of discipline out there that has not been enriched by contributions from St. Albert the Great. And that's why he's called the Great, because he excelled everybody else in what he knew and, and the way he taught. Add to that fact that he was not only scientifically wired or grounded, but that he was equally smart and erudite and learned about spiritual things and the truths of philosophy as well. He truly believed that every single piece of scientific knowledge had something to say about the wisdom and power of God. Ohio Dominican University has a sister college in New Haven, Connecticut, and that college is named Albertus Magnus, which is Latin for Albert the Great. And those students, like you, strive to be infused with the love and the life of learning as Albert the Great was. He had a very special student, too, that you will know about, Thomas Aquinas, during his teaching tenure, who he always said his knowledge surpassed his own. He thought he was even smarter than Albert the Great. And it is recorded that on the day that Thomas died, Albert was heard to bellow out, a great light has been extinguished from the church. Now, the same thing was probably said of Albert when he died. Dominicans feel, because this is a Dominican feast and St. Albert is a Dominican, Dominicans feel so privileged that both of these men, Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, uh, are brilliant stars in their order. And everyone that's in a Dominican college strives to emulate that and be like Thomas and Albert. Uh, Albert died at the age of 73, following his unusually weakened body very quickly, as well as he, his mind became very clouded, he could not remember, he forgot everything. When Albert was canonized as a saint by the church in 1933, he was proclaimed a doctor of the church, which is a high privilege in the church to be declared a doctor. That means that all of your doctrines and all of your things that you taught are perfectly legitimate. Oh my goodness, what am I doing here? Um, and so he was proclaimed the patron saint of sciences and the patron saint of researchers of natural scientists. So we pray today that Albert the Great will shine his light on all of us who are present here and who invoke his name and continue to live under his mantle, finding God in everything. And so let's pray together. Dear scientist and doctor of the church, you who saw the hand of God in everything and were convinced that everything speaks of God. And everybody can say that prayer. Albert, you who understood that God lives and moves in our lives constantly. Albert, you who were so gifted with wisdom and understanding about life and creation, help us to... Albert, you who set the hearts of so many on fire with the word of God, give us the desire for reflection and quiet so we can hear what you are saying in the stillness of our hearts and be on fire for preaching the word. And let's pray together, everyone. 
May we as Dominican scholars to be peace, to build peace, and to preach peace in any way we can. Amen. I have been waiting a long, long time to meet this wonderful lady sitting here named Sister Sharon Zayak. Her reputation and love of earth has preceded her, and she has been a voice for the earth for many, many, many years. Well, not that many. <laughs> Sister Sharon was born in Great Falls, Montana, because her father was a career Air Force guy, so the family traveled extensively when they were children growing up. Sister Sharon graduated from a high school in Redlands, California, and the next year she entered the Springfield, Illinois Dominican Sisters, where she lives today. Her professional life began as a junior, senior uh, high school teacher, but then, and then for about a decade, she did that. And eventually, as many sisters do, she moved over to another field of hospital administrator, and she became one of the administrators in their hospital. After a sabbatical year in 1996 and 1997, Sister Sharon became terrifically interested in earth literacy ministry. And, be, and same soon became the director of what was called the Dominican Renewal Center, followed by her directorship of a, another be beautiful enterprise called the Jubilee Farm out in Springfield. She also began giving lectures on care of earth in which knowledge she excels and the reason why she was chosen today to give this lecture. Sister Sharon served in a wide array of other roles as well all over the country. Currently, she is the promoter of eco-justice for a group of Dominican congregations. She, has, um, she is currently the Laudato Action Platform Administrator for the Dominican Sisters of Springfield. And we also are studying, beginning that in, at Ohio Dominican University. During her professional tenure, Sister Sharon has been honored with the Ar Arkansas Business Women in Leadership Award she was noted as one of the top 10 women in Arkansas in 2001, and uh, she was put in the Lifetime Photo Gallery of Women Who Make a Difference. And she was presented at one point with the San Gunman County Sheriff's Department Citizen of the Year Award. So you see, she's been around. Sister Sharon is also widely published in addition to the publications and articles such as Earth Spirituality, uh, she has presented hundreds of programs, workshops, retreats, days of reflection par to, small par to parishes, to schools, to small groups of faith. And she has gone across the country and even internationally into Ireland. And she taught also in 12 districts in New Zealand. She has co-authored a book, which, she, which is now at the publishers. It's called uh, Cosmology and Christ. And soon we could be asking her if she would sign the book when we buy it from her. Now in the meantime, um, if I do not stop sharing about her wonderful awards and honors, there will be no time for the lecture. So Sister Sharon, Ohio Dominican University welcomes you warmly and long at Ohio Dominican University. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Well, good morning, everyone. I've entitled my remarks, Laudato Si, Caring for Our Common Home, 
the Dominican response. My plan is to look very briefly at the encyclical Laudato Si itself, at the subtitle on care for our common home, and at the particularly unique response we Dominicans offer a world in crisis. Now, as you know, there's no neat and tidy way to do this because we live in an interconnected universe where nothing stands by itself. Nothing can be understood except in relation to everything else. So rather than following a plan, I'm really going to probably be weaving a tapestry. I am so pleased to be with you all celebrating our Dominican feast of St. Albert the Great. Now my congregation specifically chose November 15th, a year ago, to publicly announce our commitment to the church's Laudato Si Action platform inaugurated by Pope Francis. And it was the perfect day to do so. Albert, Dominican, friar, philosopher, theologian, scientist. A quick look at Wikipedia tells us his interests included just about every academic study of the day. Physiology, mineralogy, astrology, geography, astronomy, music theory, natural science, alchemy, natural philosophy, jurisprudence, politics. So truly scientist and theologian and his many gifts to the order, to the church, to the world are a perfect context for my remarks this morning. It's been seven years now since Pope Francis wrote the extraordinary encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. And among many of his powerful insights, perhaps the most telling, is his acknowledgement that we humans are guided by two great sources of wisdom, science and religions. And note he uses the plural, religions, stating that we must learn from all the world's faith traditions, not just our own, but the collective wisdom of all cultures from the faith of the whole human community. Science and faith. Both are essential in understanding who we are and how we are to relate to the world. It is not about science or faith, but science and faith. So how Dominican for a Jesuit Pope? Now we Dominicans have long recognized that it is through all the academic disciplines that we find God, and Albert certainly personifies that science and faith. Neither alone will save us, and both are intimately interconnected. We come to understand the divine only through knowing and understanding the world around us and the cosmos of which we are part. It has ever been thus. We humans have only ever come to know the divine through creation and our created senses. Holy mystery, whom we have named God, makes itself known through creation. And if we have a misunderstanding of creation and how it works, we have a false idea of God, as our Dominican brother Thomas Aquinas told us centuries ago. A mistake in our understanding of creation will necessarily cause a mistake in our understanding of God. Without science, our faith has no foundation. Theology is based upon our understanding of the world and how it works, and it is science that teaches us that. And our faith in a God that has loved this whole marvelous creation into existence tells us that we have a responsibility to preserve and protect all that has been created. In fact, we are called to be co-creators with God on this grand endeavor called universe. And we co-create only with the deepest humility. Thomas wrote that the human is not the most excellent thing in the universe 
The universe is the most excellent thing. We are a member of the universal community, the earthen community, and we cannot survive, let alone thrive, without the rest of creation. And thanks to science, we now understand better than ever before that our human choices have consequences, not only for our own persons, or even our near neighbors, but for people across the planet. And what is more, we are coming to understand how the whole planet is affected by our choices, all the lives of other than humankind, as well as the very ecosystems that support the whole of life. Rivers and oceans, prairies and rainforests, and even the atmosphere itself. Those rules, which I presume they still teach in kindergarten, have even greater significance than we ever imagine. Play fair, share what you have, clean up after yourself, and leave something for others. And the encyclical speaks to that. Unlike any other papal encyclical, Laudato Si has had a profound effect around the world, actually, even before it was written. Though unfortunately ignored in many Catholic dioceses, particularly here in the US, it continues to be lifted up among world leaders, chiefs of the United Nations, religious orders and congregations, leaders of other faith traditions, scientists, and representatives of social movements. I continue to hear it referred to in any number of non-faith-based webinars I attend. Now, it is not a perfect document. There is no such thing as perfection in an evolving world. But it remains timely, significant. It has a solid foundation in Catholic social teaching, and it is rooted in our Judeo-Christian values. And equally important, it speaks to the interconnectedness of the whole of life on this planet, the feedback loop of consequences of every one of our economic and political decisions, and our moral obligation to be co-workers with God in the building up of creation, an obligation we have mismanaged and even abused these last few centuries. Again, thanks to science and communications technology, we no longer have excuse for any ignorance that our lifestyle choices, our cultural, political, and corporate decisions are the causes of climate disruption. So much so that we can effectively say that the climate crisis is now the overarching justice issue facing us all. It either drives or greatly exacerbates the loss of ecosystems and biodiversity, migration, human trafficking, economic disparity, war, violence against women and children, the lack of peace and security. We now face, for the first time in the history of our species, a crisis that threatens the whole of life as we have known it. Franciscan friar Dan Horan, director of the Center for Spirituality and professor of philosophy, religious studies, and theology at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana, states it well. What good is it to focus on one specific life issue, he says, if there is no air to breathe, water to drink, land to farm, plants or animals to eat, or habitats free from flooding, hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, or some of the other devastating weather phenomena. Human-induced climate disruption is this generation's life issue. And it is a uniquely human challenge in that we are the only species who can respond to it. That makes it a moral issue. The rest of creation can only react, possibly adapt, or fail to survive. It is also a religious issue. 
For decades, a long line of bishops, as well as Pope John Paul II and Benedict XVI, have spoken of ecological degradation as a social mortal sin in the truest sense. And Pope Francis had made that very clear throughout his papacy, certainly in a poignant way with this encyclical and with a recently launched Laudato Si Action platform, which is based upon the encyclical's premises. And it is an issue now emphasized by all major faith traditions. So allow me to highlight just a few of the overarching themes of Laudato Si. Now there are many that Francis names, but I am going to refer to some of those named by the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops shortly after the encyclical was released. Laudato Si is a call first and foremost to an ecological conversion, a transformation of consciousness that recognizes the integrity of the whole of life and all which supports life. In paragraph 139, Francis writes, when we speak of the environment, what we really mean is a relationship. Nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. We are part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. Now, two key ideas here. We are part of nature, and it is about relationship. We are who we are only because we are in relationship with one another, with the whole of creation, with God. We humans are nothing by ourselves. We cannot claim to love God or one another and ignore the needs of the rest of the earth community. We cannot say we love earth and ignore the needs of our human sisters and brothers. Laudato Si speaks to the common good of all, for human and other than humankind, and for the soil and air and waterways and rainforests and oceans, because unless they are all healthy, life cannot be healthy. Now, Francis uses the term integral ecology, which simply stated means that what happens anywhere affects everyone, everywhere. The encyclical is also a call to face the reality that climate disruption is very real and with ever increasing devastation. Denying it does not make it go away. Refusing to acknowledge our culpability does not relinquish our responsibility for action. The encyclical is a call to address our planetary issues by engaging in dialogue, especially with those most affected by the devastation, those marginalized by their color or their economic or cultural status, or even by their other than human status. Years ago, we in Justice Work talked about being the voice for the voiceless. We recognize now that no one is voiceless. Each subject of creation has its own voice, its own manner of communicating. The issue is that we don't hear or listen or even realize they are speaking. Science is teaching us otherwise. We have begun to acknowledge that animals are far more intelligent than we once thought. We are now learning about the intelligence of life itself, of plants, of trees and forests, of fungi and rivers. We need to relearn those languages so their needs are not ignored or discounted in our decision making. Now certainly our indigenous brothers and sisters have much to teach us here. The encyclical is a call to study and learn from Earth's interconnected realities so we can effectively work to alleviate oppression in any of its forms and to ensure, as best we can, the common good for all. As Dominicans, 
we have a particular call to preach about right relationships, about a justice that speaks to the inherent dignity and the irrevocable rights of others to live their lives to the fullest. And again, not just other humans, but the entirety of life and all that which supports life, the soil, the air, the rivers, the oceans. Now, even as too many in this country seem bent on retracting and denying fundamental rights to every human, others of us are finally coming to understand that the whole of creation has rights, rights that should be protected in our courts of law. Now, sounds strange. We in the US have granted rights of personhood to human constructed corporations, many of which are now far more powerful than national governments and in effect have no one in authority over them. And aren't we reaping those consequences? How much more then should life itself, creation itself have that same privilege? In 2008, Ecuador became the first country to give rights to nature in its constitution. Bolivia followed in 2011 with laws that give equal rights to nature. Now, are they stumbling in living these out? Sure, sometimes egregiously so. But the consciousness that established that precedence will not be dismissed. In 2017, New Zealand granted legal rights to the Fanganui River. In 2018, in India, the Ganges and Yamuni rivers were protected, and though later struck down in a court of law, the precedent has been set. As of 2019, people in Bangladesh who damage a river can be taken to court and tried because each of its rivers now has the right to life. And although later struck down in court, voters in Toledo in 2019 granted Lake Erie the same legal rights as human beings. And this list is growing to include ecosystems and certain native plant species and animals. Once we realize that we are all intimately interconnected, we then understand that when we deny the rights of any one of us, we in effect compromise the rights of all. And the encyclical tells us we do all this with the intention to leave the world we inhabit a much better place for the children and grandchildren, not just of our species, but of all species. And the encyclical tells us we Excuse me. So the work before us to heed the cry of earth and the cry of the poor, the most vulnerable, is calling us to a deeper understanding of the intricate web of interrelationship that exists in order that we might effectively help rebuild relationships rather than in our ignorance only add to the problems. Now, this is not a new theology. What many, Francis particularly, is calling earth spirituality or eco-spirituality. It is not new. It comes from the very core of who we are as earth creatures. So let me take just a few moments to share some insights from the Hebrew scriptures. The English translation of the encyclical subtitle is Care for Our Common Home. Now, we often hear the words that we are to care for creation, right? We are to be caretakers for earth. Another common expression is that we are to be stewards of creation. Neither caring for creation or being stewards of creation adequately reflects our role and responsibility to the community of life on earth neither expresses the depth of the obligation that is ours to live as responsible members of the earth community. Neither requires from us accountability for our actions <clears throat> or the need to understand 
how our actions affect the whole. We can care in the most altruistic sense, yet do little to alleviate the suffering or address the underlying issues that causes the suffering. And the term steward in the Christian scriptures refers to a person put in charge of the household while the master is away. So does our use of that word suggest that God is an absentee landlord? God made earth, left it in our hands to do whatever we think best and lives elsewhere. Where? Off the planet? Up? In heaven? Evidently not too terribly concerned about it all? Nothing we believe about a loving creator God supports that. The entire planet, earth, is God's household. And yet still, we hold to the story that we were given the mandate to be in charge, to dominate, and to control. To take what we call resources only for ourselves and ignore that these gifts of water and soil are necessary for the balance of the whole of life. The Hebrew understanding of the creation story in Genesis tells us that being made in God's image and likeness does not mean that we look like God, or as I always say, that we look like slightly under 50% of us look like God. So it doesn't mean that we look like God, okay? But that we are to act like God. We are to act as God acts. And how does God act in Genesis? God lovingly and carefully creates the garden, the sanctuary of Eden, earth, so that all living things might flourish. God waits until the sixth day, 13.8 billion years, to create Adam, the creature of earth, from the Adama, the clay of earth. All has to be in place so this latest creature can flourish. Giving humans dominion was not at all about domination. For the Hebrew, dominion means that we are to be blessing. We are to bring blessing to the rest of the earth community, just as does the creator. And as co-workers with God, having been made in God's likeness, our work to till the garden, to till the land, means that we are to preserve it to serve it so all might benefit from it. All might benefit from the goodness of God's creativity. Such is our relationship with one another, with God, with earth. So Laudato Si is actually a wake-up call to how far we have moved from God's original dream. It outlines the ecological devastation we humans have unleashed by our choices through willful self-centeredness or genuine ignorance of the connections that make up the web of life. But we can no longer claim ignorance. We see with our own eyes what is happening. We hear from science, from our indigenous sisters and brothers, and from the wisdom of our own faith tradition. The urgency of climate disruption demands a response now. It is not the work of the next generation to do this. It is our work now. So how do we respond to the overwhelming and ever-increasing urgency of the challenges facing us? As best we can. With the best knowledge and whatever abilities and creativity we have at any given point. With what and who we are. And we are, first of all, humans concern for the fate of the planet, for the life it supports and nourishes. Second, we are a people of faith who come from a rich 2,000 plus year spiritual heritage of the church's teaching of our intimate relationship with creation. That heritage tells us that the created world is an expression, a manifestation of a creator who continually pours forth an immensity of cosmic love that we will never comprehend. 
And when this question about response is asked of me by religious congregations and its institutions, I add that we respond in light of our charism, our particular gift to the church, to the world. As Dominicans, as a Dominican-sponsored institution, we contribute our own nuanced understanding of creation, and we dishonor our own heritage if we do not offer our insights to the world. So what is it that we Dominicans offer? Well, let's start at the very beginning, briefly, and I'm sure many of you know the story. In the 12th and 13th centuries, the Albigensian heresy had taken stronghold in southern France. This dualistic worldview, still very much with us today, splits the universe into a struggle between good and evil. The physical, tangible world is the creation of the evil god. It is inherently corrupt, it has no value in itself, and it is a source of temptation. Value lies only in the invisible spiritual universe, the realm of the good god. It is where all souls long to go to escape the burdens of the material world. The practical living out of this worldview leads to a corrupted spirituality and many abuses, ones we still witness every day around the world. Now the bishops of the day asked the Cistercian monks to stop, or to stop the spread of the heresy and go out to the villages to preach the gospel. And as the story goes, they came riding into the villages on their horses and dressed in their finery, and the poor they came to teach didn't listen to them. Why should they? The monks preached the gospel but didn't apparently live by its words. They weren't credible. Dominic witnessed that and knew he would reach the poor with the gospel message only when he himself lived as those he wanted to reach. And what is the gospel message? That God is the loving creator of all and finds goodness and integrity in the whole of creation. Early in our history, Albert the Great grasped the connection between the worldview that supported the Albigensian dualism and the theology that worldview created. He undertook the massive task of replacing the cosmology of Plato with that of Aristotle. I can just imagine academia's response. Plato's cosmology, utilized by academia at the time, taught that the material world is not reality. It's only shadows of reality. And though we now know from a quantum physics perspective it had real validity, it was a cosmology that supported the denigration and irrelevance of the material world. And though Aristotle's cosmology has a number of significant and faulty premises, it did teach that reality is found in this material world and it has its own value and importance. So taking on this entirely new cosmology from Plato to Aristotle, a new understanding of reality caused the whole of academia to shift as well, not least of which led to a new understanding of the divine and how God works in the world, science and faith. And it was Thomas Aquinas who took on that immense task acknowledging that cosmology is the context for theology. How we see the creation is how we come to know the creator. Thomas literally spent, gave his life, rewriting our understanding of the divine and giving us a theology that has dominated the last 800 years. Now, our present age is taking on a whole new cosmology being revealed to us through science. So I ask, where are we Dominicans in taking up that challenge and holding true to the legacy 
of Albert and Thomas. Today's science is proving to us what we humans have intuited from the beginning, that which our indigenous sisters and brothers still know at the deepest of levels. We do not live in a dualistic universe. We are all so interconnected with one another that what we do to any one of our sisters and brothers, we do to all. So, from our very Dominican roots, we are called to preach this truth and to live it in such a way that our preaching is credible. Dominic called us to live the holy preaching, to be the holy preaching, to be what we preach. The early Dominicans, in fact, called their local communities the holy preaching. The justice we preach, modeled by Jesus, is that of right relationship with God and with one another. It is the work of whole making. Once again, making whole, healing, what has been previously divided by our short-sightedness, our greed, our ignorance, our self-centeredness, our misguided search for safety and security. We are called to preach a justice that speaks to the inherent dignity and the irrevocable right of others to live their lives to the fullest. Again, not just humans, but the entirety of life and all that which supports life. Because we understand so well that unless all flourishes, none can flourish. Veritas. Our charism, our gift to the church, to the world, is to speak truth about the injustices perpetrated against the vulnerable. But it is not just about what we preach, but why we preach and how we preach. We Dominicans often speak of the four pillars of the four elements of Dominican life. You say study, prayer, community, and service. service. Okay. Study. Dominicans have always honored all the academic disciplines as ways of finding God acting in the world. And we've taken to heart that we have to know what is happening in the world and why. That requires reading, listening, study, dialogue, actively discerning what is scientific hype, or fact, <laughs> what is scientific fact and what is false hype. And we pray literally for the life of the world. And when we are honest in our prayer, we are open to our own conversion, our own transformation. As with Dominic, our study and our prayer both feed our preaching the message of the dignity of the whole of life to a world that doesn't want to have to change its ways of doing things. And our preaching becomes credible, meaningful, when we actually live what we preach. If we preach right relationship with words, we have to work to live in right relationship with, with each other and with every other member of the earth community. And that encompasses the whole of community, the whole of common life. If we preach words of compassion, we must strive to live and share that compassion inclusively with all life. We cannot preach what we do not live and remain whole ourselves. And now, we're being asked, along with the rest of the church, to participate in the Laudato Sea Action Platform. Now, this plan comes from the Vatican Dicastery for Promoting Human Integral Development in concert with worldwide working groups to engage all seven sectors of the Catholic community, families, dioceses and parishes, all educational institutions, that's you, hospitals and healthcare centers, organizations, businesses and agriculture, and religious orders, to move toward that transformation of heart needed to take the necessary actions that will move us towards sustainability. Now this plan was inaugurated last year and it's being implemented literally around the globe. Francis recognizes what is needed to address the urgency of the climate crisis. Social scientists tell us that 
21 to 25 percent of any given population is the critical mass needed to make irreversible systemic change. The church's 1.2 billion members make up a little more than 16 percent. So what a force of change we would be as we work together toward achieving the seven Laudato Si goals, responding to the cry of earth, responding to the cry of the poor, building ecological economies, adopting simple lifestyles, creating ecological education, recovering ecological spirituality, and promoting community action and advocacy. So in many ways, the Laudato Si Action Platform models the holy preaching. It is a call for all of us to come together as church and to make the necessary choices that will help us co-create the kind of world God intends. It can no longer just be the future we all hope to see. It must become the work we do now. The science is clear, the urgency is now. Now, early in my remarks, I stated that the climate crisis is now the context for all issues of justice. I'm going to leave you with an even greater radical statement. Radical, from the Latin word radix, which means root. We are now at a point where we can say that the single most urgent life issue is climate change. Now, when we speak about life issues, our minds often go to the one issue that speaks most loudly and clearly for us. It is probably safe to say that many of us would not think climate change. But as more of us embrace a consistent ethic of life, we awaken to the awareness of the sanctity of all life in its many forms and variations from conception to natural death. How do you suppose God would answer if asked which life issue is most important? What part of the created world would God hold above all else and say, this one is the most important life issue to me? Would it be the young, the old, men, women, the unborn, the dying, the poor, the disenfranchised, the wealthy, the movers and shakers? Yes. Would God not also include the other two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the finned, the rooted. Yes. Don't you suppose that in the eyes of the creator, the whole of created life has infinite value? Does not God create all of it? We say that God is love. God does not love the way we love. God does not prioritize. In fact, God does not love. God is love. God loves with all that God is. God is love. Love itself cannot apportion more love or less love for any particular life or any particular aspect of creation. Love loves with all it is, loves all that is, fully, completely, inclusively. And does not our being made in the image and likeness of God also call us to that kind of inclusive love? The exponentially worsening consequences of climate disruption are ours to address. They are a uniquely human challenge in that we are the only species who can respond to it. The human poor and the rest of creation can only react, possibly adapt, or fail to survive. There is 
so much broken in our world, and it calls out for healing, for compassion, for justice. We are all called to a transformation of heart and to respond to the challenges facing us with all the variety of gifts and passions and skills we possess. It is not someone else's call, someone else's responsibility. It is each of ours, and the time is now. Thank you. Sister Diane asked me to just make a couple quick remarks. I know some people have class at noon, so I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to reemphasize a couple of things we heard there. I always try to encourage my environmental science students to think about the fact that we are part of nature, that we sometimes feel a little absent, divorced, separated from it, but in reality, what we do is directly reliant upon and has impacts upon nature. Which leads me to my second point, and I want to always encourage everyone to think about this, your decisions matter. That what you do has consequences. Um, they can be good consequences, they can be bad consequences, but we always need to be remembering that your choices, they're choices that actually have effects for everyone. Please uh, join me in thanking Sister Sharon.